one of the buildings at the site, and I made a department called Manufacturing Sciences and Technology hyphen Frontline Support. <laughs> so, so when there's a problem, they send one of us <laughs> to the manufacturing floor. And I'm going to go over some basics, uh, get introduction to a little bit of what I do, which is processing cleaning validation in the biologic realm. And a little bit about me. I am a local lady. I went to Walkersville, played field hockey, um, was a stats person for the boys' varsity basketball team, so I kept my nerd status. Um, I attended UMBC. I majored in chemistry, minored in psychology. Um, in the center of my life, of course, is my family. My husband is a senior principal electrical engineer for JLG and Mary, the smartest man I could find. And my daughter her name is Maggie. She's a first grader at Walkersville Elementary. Um, where she loves playing with snap circuits and Legos and chemistry sets, so we're on the right path. <laughs> my hobbies include sewing, wine making. I've won some blue ribbons at the Great Frederick Fair. Uh, gardening, uh, and we like to travel, so we've been to, there's the Barney Castle, and there's the Parthenon. I'm a geocacher. Nice. I'm, I'm in a book club with a bunch of friends, and I just joined a hundred women who care in Frederick, which is a really great charity. So, uh, a lot of my hobbies are about putting puzzles together and solving issues, and of course the fermentation of it. Oh, and my career path. So in 1997, I graduated high school and I started working at the Union Bridge Pharmacy because I wanted to be a pharmacist. <laughs> and it took one summer and I realized I do not want to be a pharmacist. <laughs> it has way too much social work for me. I like, but I like working with the medicine and reading the facts and comparisons. That was really exciting. And this gentleman here is Dr. Donald B. Elliott. He's owner and operator of the pharmacy, and he's also a delegate for the state of Maryland for Carroll County. And uh, the pharmacy was his campaign office. It was pretty cool working there at the college. And um, he helped me do my homework. <laughs> and he, he went um, as part of a delegate for Carroll County to a trip to Metamune at the time. It wasn't AstraZeneca yet. And he's like, Michelle. If you get a job there, you have to take it. And I got a job there. <laughs> uh, I interviewed for a lot of places with a chemistry degree. You have so many options. My mom thought I was crazy majoring in chemistry. I and mean, she's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I don't know. But I interviewed places like McCormick Spice Company and small scale bench top places. And, and it was really cool. Um, but I got a job at Medellin and I started working in plasma fractionation. There it is. So I would take human blood plasma and adjust pH and fraction it using a centrifuge as big as my car into different fractions of paste. Some we would sell and some we would manufacture. I'm not allowed to say what you want to do me. That's part of my disclosure. Um, but it was exciting, dangerous, worked lots of shifts, um, and it got my feet wet in manufacturing. There was also long shutdowns because the drug that was needed, we could make like big quantities and you didn't need that many batches per year. So they would sucker me into other departments and I would use this little machine called a MET-1 and it would have a little air sucker. It would suck the air down here and it would do um, a particulate count and um, for environmental monitoring for, bio, for the microbiology side of things to make sure your air quality was good in the rooms because you are working in ISO-classificated rooms. And then one shutdown, I got to wear my QA badge, a quality assurance badge, and I was sent to the production facility that makes the flu mist vaccine to do field checks and um, review batch records and release raw materials. So I get to see different sides of the business. So I got to do manufacturing, quality control, and quality assurance all within a couple of years. Well, in 2002, we sold this uh, plasma drug to another company, and that's where Dr. Elliott comes in. He's like, Michelle, you work for a company, and they didn't lay one single person off. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. They moved me into Synergist production. And Synergist is a drug for premature and immunosuppressed infants to fight respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. 
and I was the poster child in 2005. <laughs> um, I'm working with a fiery actor, and um, I also got to start working with a lot of purification techniques. They're really using my chemistry um, separation techniques. Right there, we would do um, binding the loot and capture column or capture columns, and then flow through column chromatography. And I got to see a little bit of upstream learning about the fermentation process, taking a cell culture from a small vial up to a 2,000 liter scale bioreactor. Well, after a while, you start getting a little bored because you're not being very innovative, right? You're in the large scale, and um, you start asking for more work. So they started making me a swab person. I started taking swabs uh, that would measure total organic carbon. So I would swab the vessels, I would swab ports and the chrome skins, all different kinds of equipment. And the reason you would swab uh, for total organic carbon is to make sure you don't have product carrying over between product A and to product B. To show that your, your uh, cleaning program is robust and you don't have residual product going into the next batch. I liked it so much, I joined their department. And um, I was like always working on cleaning validation, so I swallowed for years and years. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I came back from vacation one day, and they're like, you've been invited to a kickoff meeting for a new drug. Yes, that's exciting. And I can't say what the drug is, but it's really cool. And we recently got approval. <laughs> Um, and I have learned about the process validation life cycle, which I'll get more into. And I liked it so much that now I just want to look at data all the time. I'll go into this. <laughs> all I do is like compare old data to new data, and we'll go into that part of my path. This is where um, I'm transitioning from process validation into my frontline support. I'm learning about all the different products, and I have a background in cleaning. Um, and quality control and quality assurance, so they trust my decision making. And so much so, they made me a manager. And <laughs> now I have a small team of people to boss around. <laughs> so AstraZeneca, um, it, you know, it's the biological arm, or Frederick's site is the biological arm of AstraZeneca. You've probably seen commercials for some of their small scale drugs like Crestor, Relenta, Nexium. Sometimes you see a commercial percentages. Um, but um, we do the biologic side of it. And it's the largest biologic site for EZ right now. Uh, and we manufacture medicines to treat cancer, respiratory, cardiovascular diseases, and auto, auto, uh, autoimmune conditions like psoriasis, um, working on stuff for asthma, COPD. It, we have a huge pipeline. And, there's lots of careers out there. Obviously, I've hit a few of them with manufacturing, QA, QC, and MST. There's also facilities, engineering, supply chain, and so much more. And our mission statement is we push the boundaries of science to deliver life-changing medicines. And I think we all feel that way at work every day. It feels good to know that we're doing something right for the community and providing um, a better quality of life for our patients. So. The campus, so this is the building we all see from Route 70 and 15. Um, that's a 15,000 liter scale bioreactor facility. We have four 15,000 liter um, bioreactors. Over here is um, an older building. It was our first building, and then we built this in 2009. This is building 636, and that is a 2,000 liter bioreactor scale facility that we can do some small batch um, commercial product and also some um, large scale clinical campaigns. Then, right there, is building 660. There's a lot of uh, quality control labs over here. And then this is the old SolarX building. Do you guys remember that? We're turning, we bought that, we're turning it into a giant warehouse. Taking over Frederick County. <laughs> yeah. Little by little. Oh, oh look, there's some uh, fun facts. <laughs> 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 it's like communication first. He's like, you gotta put these in. Like, okay. Uh, so, uh, small molecules, they're very low in size. Um, 
an example of this aspirin. It's made by just synthesizing um, the drug via chemical reactions, and the biologics is a bit more complex, where you're taking li living cells, um, hybridoma cells, and um, growing a monoclonal antibody in them, like growing the cells up, and then cleaving the protein, the antibody, from the cells, and purifying it. So, just for an effect, <laughs> that's aspirin. Yeah. And this is aspirin compared to a monoclonal antibody. Pretty big. And um, so we'll go over like a basic biologic process flow. We start with a very small vial of working cell bank, and we put it into a shake flask with a bit of media to help the cells grow, give, give them some food, give them the right temperature, we shake them a little bit, get some agitation going in. And over time, we take this and we split it, and we can split it over and over and over again until it's ready for um, the size of a bioreactor. So the bioreactor is doing the same thing, it is feeding it healthy stuff, um, watching its pH, making sure it's happy, make sure the cells are happy, it's all about keeping the cells happy, agitating them, um, giving some dissolved oxygen, loving environment for the cells to grow, and then we put the cells from the production reactor into a centrifuge. It's an interversal centrifuge icon. Right? Don't think I'm pretty. Um, so that's where we're breaking the cells from the antibody, and we're filtering out the antibodies and putting them into a harvest tank. The harvest material um, could go, usually goes through three columns. This example has a protein A capture column and then a uh, cation exchange and anion exchange. So the harvested material would go through the protein A column, and at that point the product is binding to the resin in the column, and all the residual DNA and impurities from the production reactor would loop off, and we then collect what's bound to the protein A resin. Following that, there's typically a virus inactivation. So our cells are mammalian cells, and uh, like any animal, there's potential for viruses. So you have to do an, an activation step where you're bringing the pH down to inactivate any viruses that could be in the tank. And you hold it there for a certain amount of time, and you bring the pH back up um, to protect the protein. You can't keep it too low for too long, or you're, um, you start to denature your protein. Then we filter that out to make sure we can filter out any viruses that have been inactivated, and we push it through a cation exchange. Again, this is a binding the loop column where you're binding the product onto the resin of the column, and you're washing off any impurities that could be in there. More filters. By the way, all the little yellow cylinders are 0.2 micron filters. And then it goes through an anion exchange. This is typically a flow-through column where you're, instead of binding the product to the resin, you're going to bind the impurities to the resin and flush out the protein and send it to a product collection tank. So a lot of purification techniques that we're not done. Um, then there's a virus filtration. This is uh, a nanofiltration step. So we had the 0.2 micron filters, and now we're on the order of 15 to 20 nanometers to push the product through. The, the virus filtration, the point of that is to capture any viruses that would have still made it through the virus inactivation step. So the viruses are much larger than the 15 to 20 nanometers, so they would not go through the filter, only the product would go through the filter. Following virus filtration, we do some ultrafiltration, diafiltration, and this is where we exchange the buffer that was used to do the virus filtration with our final formulation buffer. The formulation buffer is the ex part of the excipients in the drug. So it's, the excipients are what helps stabilize the drugs for its shelf life. Then one more filtration, and it's bulk, that little blue square. Um, we bulk it into tanks, we bulk it into bags. Uh, at Frederick, we don't do any um, bulking into vials. So we ship the bags or the, or the bulk tanks to a, another site where they then put it into pre-filled syringes or vials. So we, we don't do fill finish. Maybe one day.
<clears throat> There's lots of jobs in this industry. There's research and development, um, where you're actually being innovative, you're there doing drug discovery, and, and then the first phase is a clinical trial. ms &T, which is uh, my department, so we kind of have like a manufacturing sandbox. Our sandbox is the old, old plant, like back here. We have a few labs where we have small scale, like three liter bioreactors, and we can try to um, find ways to improve the process, maybe streamline it some more, try to save us money, save us time, increase the titer or the yield. Um, so we have, the MSG is kind of like the liaison between R&D and manufacturing. We're also doing the scalability of bringing the clinical batch sizes to the production, natural commercial sizes. Supply chain, um, they are our strategic people. They uh, vet out our suppliers for raw materials. They schedule movement of product. Uh, and they also release raw materials. Quality. You know, you, you have to have a quality hat on all the time to make sure you're delivering a product that's safe and effective to your patients. So they review a lot of documentation and or any investigations. Facilities and engineering. <coughs> there. I need to back that building. Really nice. Good me that. Smaller picture. So for six for this the large building, that is just offices. This major part is the production suite, and then way back here is all utilities. We have to make our own water. It's about, I think it's about $8 a liter to make water. It's water for injection, so it's safe enough to inject. Uh, we purify our own air. Uh, we have specialty gases that we have to bring in. So all of that is in our, uh, it's called a central utilities building. And we all have to maintain that and all the equipment we use to manufacture the drugs. Manufacturing operations, these are the guys that actually make the product. They're running all the equipment, running batch records and procedures. And there's finance, human resources, and she. So someone's got to keep the lights on and keep us safe and stock is full of people. So uh, this is my good friend, Triana. She's uh, standing at the top of a bioreactor. It's actually two levels tall. Uh, you can see it's like taller than her head. She's my height, her perspective. How many years is that? 15,000. Uh, so she's also an MSNT, and what MSNT does is support ongoing manufacturing operations uh, and monitoring, which we'll get into, helping with investigations and finding ways to make the production line more optimal. And a career ladder. So I started <laughs> in plasma fractionation. I was like, I love this ladder. Um, <laughs> and now I'm here. You know. But um, we bring in manufacturing technology associates. Uh, they're usually right out of college, uh, not much experience. And as they gain more experience, they get promoted and get more fun projects to work on. And then you have a decision. You can go the managerial pathway, or you can build on your technical knowledge, and you can go between. So, um, when you get here, you have to make a decision, and, and right here, it's like equivalent to a senior manager, a principal scientist would be equivalent to an associate director. So, there's opportunity for growth. I looked at the job description for a manufacturing scientist we have posted, and it kind of came down to four buckets. You have to be um, good at project management because you're going to be given lots of projects that you have to execute at the same time. Working in multifunctional groups. So you have to be a team player. You have to be able to meet your deadlines. And then you also provide manufacturing support. I have to have two phones on me, one for home and one for work. And you get calls all day and night because we make product 24 hours a day. 365 days a year. I've worked every holiday in your command. Um, develop investigation findings, make recommendations. This is where we get to play their sandbox a little bit. Make detailed observations, analyze data, interpret results, 
and um, you're also going to help to make a lot of decisions for the company. Uh, in the meantime, you also have to maintain your industry knowledge. We're, like, we're expected to be part of several different organizations. Um, there's two that I'm a part of. It's one is the PDA, it's the Parenteral Drug Association. Um, they help, they partner with different regulatory agencies, mostly FDA, to build strategy and kind of in, help interpret FDA guidances. There's also another group I'm part of called the BPOG, the Biofarm Operations Group. Uh, again, partnering with agency groups to drive regulation. So not only are we have to be up to date with the regulation, we have to also help drive it. And then leadership. So at my level, it's expected I'm equivalent to a manager, so I have to be managing a small team. A day in my life. Um, we are very much about standardized work and working in a lean Six Sigma fashion. So I have to have a leader standard work. It's a requirement for everyone in my department. So I have to <clears throat> fill this out every day and go over it with my manager every month um, to make sure that I don't have any roadblocks. If there are, she has to take them away <laughs> so I can get my job done. So a typical day for me is we have a team huddle where we um, review what activities are going on in the shop floor, what investigations we need to take part in, and kind of divide and conquer. Uh, I do a lot of peer review for uh, method validations. Methods are the assays that we use, like fire burning and toxin, bioassays, um, reviewing cleaning validation and process validation. Checking with some people, and then it's, most of this is just Keeping up to date with my training, I have a lot of safety training, as Nina had mentioned earlier, and it's like an annual requirement. Um, just a lot of managerial stuff, checking my team's training, checking their tasks to make sure they're on point, and uh, working on various projects. I work a 12-hour shift. I work uh, an eight-and-a-half to nine-hour shift. Um, so what is validation? So does anyone know when the FDA began? 1906. 1906. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until the 1970s that we really required validation. And the reason for that is <laughs> all that time. <laughs> uh, so validation, yeah. Validation is the process of making sure you have documented evidence that your process is consistent and robust to ensure that your patient gets the same drug every single time, that there's no differences in concentration or appearance. And that was 70 years of, well, it looks good at the end. And, <laughs> and what happened were there were some injectable drugs that had contamination issues. So these two gentlemen from FDA, Byers and Loftus, they started writing white, white papers and like, wait, we need to make sure that the process is the same at each stage, from file fall through fill finish, and you guys need to monitor this and report out on it on a regular basis. And that's when validation jobs started appearing. Uh, and the first type of validation I want to talk about is cleaning validation, since it's near and dear to my heart. And for all your chemistry teachers, I'm sure you're very big on having clean glassware but you don't want to interfere with the next experiment. So, cleaning validation <clears throat> is to provide documented evidence that your cleaning program is robust and can always clean your equipment to acceptance criteria. And we'll go over some acceptance criteria. But basically, we clean everything in place, all automated. So you have a clean in place, or a CIP supply, and it can come into a tank through spray balls, through a low point dip tube, or through a J tube, and there's different types of cleaning. So when it hits the sidewall, it's called spray ball impingement, and then it kind of cascades down the wall and kind of soaks here for a little bit, comes out, and goes to the CIP return to drain. And I have another slide talking about the different stages of CIP. But it all started in the dairy industry because we want our milk to be clean. And it was very manual. You had to, like this poor gentleman, walk into a system and hand scrub and wash it. And, you know, we got a 
build a better mousetrap for cleaning our equipment. So we started automating it in the early 1980s with Clean in Place CIP. And the basic law is if you can get it wet, you can get it clean. <laughs> <laughs> So when we bring in a new product, we have to do a couple of tests to make sure it's safe to bring into our equipment, make sure it's cleanable. And the first thing we do is we give a sample to uh, ms &T person who um, takes the protein and puts it in a bioanalyzer. And representative of the blue peak is what she would see. And so you have like a monomer or maybe even a dimer peak, um, and that's your protein. And then she treats it with some of our cleaning solutions. So we use something called CIP100, which is a potassium hydroxide. So she spikes the potassium hydroxide into the protein and runs it through the bioanalyzer again, and she would see the red peak. So that monomer is completely busted apart and has therefore proven that we've denatured the protein. With that in mind, then um, I don't need a product-specific test to make sure I clear the product from the tank, I can use something called total organic carbon. Since the proteins are mostly carbon, I just want to make sure all the carbon is out of the tank. So now I know what kind of assay I can use. And then I do some bench top testing. I take coupons, which are just um, squares of different materials of our equipment. So most of the equipment is stainless steel, but there's Teflon and biton and silicon and borosilicate glass. Um, and we put a little blob of it. You can see it's all spiked. We do different things like, oh, it's splattered, streaked, you know, all different kinds of ways to evaluate it. And we do a small scale representation of how it's cleaned inside the manufacturing plant. And we sample it for TOC. We look at connectivity, because connectivity would make sure we got rid of all of our cleaning solution. And we also do a visual check to make sure it's clean. And the bioreactors, the bi so the production reactor, I should have said earlier, um, the material stays in there for up to like two weeks. So we fill up a beaker on an agitator, and we stir it in there for two weeks with um, the drug product or drug protein. And you start to get that liquid solid interface, um, like in a coffee cup, you see the ring. And we have to evaluate that for cleaning to make sure our cleaning program can bust up that crust. If all that passes, then I feel confident bringing it into our plant and using our existing cleaning program. So there's one more thing. I have to look at the automation. Not that we have any like computer science teachers, <laughs> but um, it helps to have an a understanding of some basic computer programming. So you have to review the programming for the cleaning recipe, which has certain elements like how long you clean, uh, at what pressure or flow rate, what's the concentration of your cleaning solution, to make sure it's going to be copacetic with your new product. And then we can bring it into the actual plant and make the drug, but we will still collect data. The scientists, we love data, we love comparing data, and we will still collect more TOC swabs, and we'll also look at conductivity, we'll also look at bio burden and endotoxin to make sure that we're controlling things from a microbial standpoint. Is the uh, cleaning process open loop or closed loop? Uh, it's mostly closed loop, and Frederick, there is an allowance for something called a manual soap, which is like a bin, and that's for some awkwardly shaped parts that you can't clean otherwise. So you soak it in a bin for an hour, and it has a lid on top of it. But then it would, when you put it into place for use, you have to then close it with maybe a steam socket. So the basic process for cleaning is you start with your dirty equipment, you make sure it's completely drained, and the first rinse is cold. Um, that's to help break up the protein. If you start your wash cycle off with a hot or warm temperature, it'll like melt the protein onto the surface. Like when you put that cheesy casserole dish in this thing, you use the cold water to chip it off first. And then we have our cleaning agents after the uh, initial water rinse. So we use the potassium hydroxide <coughs> to denature our protein 
And then we follow up with an acid to neutralize any of that phase. We use a phosphoric acid. And the phosphoric acid also helps protect the passive layer of stainless steel. And then one more whippy rinse. It's hot to control any uh, bio burn and toxin. And we would swab after that. And then process validation. Much like cleaning validation, process validation is making sure you have enough um, documented evidence to prove that you have a consistent and robust process. And there's a life cycle by the FDA has published. So at the first stage of the life cycle, you have your innovation, your, your concept of how the process will look and you identify variables to the process. And uh, so when you first, in stage one, you have a design space, and you do some univariate studies to test different parameters at each of these process steps we talked about to say, okay, in this space, the product is safe and effective and it's a quality product. And you tighten that range up to have a proven accessible range, and you would use multivariable multivariate studies at this point. And you would tighten it just a little bit more for manufacturing. So you want manufacturing to operate in a sweet spot. And then, you, you have, so you have your control strategy, which is that sweet spot right there, and how you're going to maintain that at the production scale. And then you go into stage two, which is um, commercial biologics production. You have to have qualified equipment, so more documented evidence operates as it's intended to, agitator speeds and everything else is calibrated, you can clean it, you can steam it, um, the computer uh, programming is all validated, and then you can introduce the product at stage 2.2 or 2B. And this is where you're collecting a lot of data in this design space to make sure your product meets this acceptance criteria. And then once the product is approved, you're in stage three, which is later on the slide deck, but it's process monitoring, where you would analyze the data <coughs> over time to make sure there's no special cause variation in your data, so like different shifts aren't more productive than the others, different seasons aren't contributing to lower yields, that kind of thing. And you keep going in the cycle, so if you change your process, you're gonna have to start all over again until you retire the drug with something even more fantastic. <laughs> Elements that we look for are process validation. So for bi biologics with the cells, we're very keen on population doubling level. So when cells are growing, um, like here, it has like a little bit of a lag phase, and as you feed them and give them the best pH and DO, it starts to take off, and then it plateaus, and it's around here, that, that's when we harvest the cell culture from the production bioreactor and start our purification process. But we need to know the age of the cells is very important, and, it's, and we calculate that by population doubling level, where you look at, so this is time, and this is cell viability. You look at the viability over time, and for each stage, you, you add it all up. You add the, each shape class stage, each seed reactor, each production reactor, and you get your population doubling number. We're looking at bio burden and endotoxin to make sure we have microbial control. We want to make sure that you know this is an indicator that our equipment is clean, that it's sterilized, and nothing, no bugs are growing into our product. We want to keep it clean. We look at things like temperature. Uh, pressure, we look at differential pressure across membranes and of different filters. We also, uh, for the purification side, um, for our chromatography methods, we look at the number of theoretical <coughs> plates and the height of theoretical plates and the asymmetry. So, um, I'm sure you guys know that, you know, the, the HETP and, and the um, number of plates are indicative of how does um, all of it know. how efficient the column is producing, how much how pure of a product is being made. So we're looking at that. And then once it's approved, we're into to something called CPV or continued process verification. And this is what I've been working on lately with um, several products. 
And um, my favorite tool is the control chart. And control charts were developed by a man named Walter Schuert. He was working for Bell Labs in the 20s, and uh, they realized that they were having some issues with their transmitters, and they were all buried underground. They don't want to do all that work, you know, digging them up and fixing them. So he started looking at the manufacturing process for the amplifiers and transmitters and saw discrepancies by using these control charts. And then he moved on to Western Electric and he met Deming. And Deming's favorite, one of my Deming's, one of my favorite Deming sayings is you can't manage what you don't measure. So he met Schuert at Western Electric and became quite a fan and adopted those principles um, with the Census Bureau and um, the Agricultural Department. And he then brought them over to Japan. He was working with the Allied Forces to rebuild Japan after World War II. And if you ever read the Toyota Way or know about the Toyota Way and more Lean Six Sigma, it was really driven by this guy. He's the father of the miracle of uh, Japanese economics, and we call it. But he introduced control charts and brought in Japan up to like the second most, um, I'm not good with words, <laughs> second best grossing um, country. So with control charts, oh, I'm looking at, well not everything's a normal bell Gaussian type curve, some things are kind of crazy, but you look at the curve and you're looking at standard deviations and building out warning limits. So the purple and red line are like the limits of the process, like you have to be within those specifications, and the blue and green lines would be your warning limits that you derive from looking at the curve. The orange line would be your center line would be your average. <coughs> so like for example, this is like, well we weren't really good at first, and then we kind of got a rhythm. But then you take that knowledge and you calculate your process capability, <coughs> uh, which is, how far away the lower limit is from the mean, and how far away the upper limit is from the mean, and the minimum of that is how capable your process is. And in biologics, and in pharmaceuticals in general, we target four standard deviations. And I was talking to other people in other industries, and they're also targeting four standard, de standard deviations, because that indicates that 63 out of 1 million batches of product would have something out of specification. It's pretty tight. Mm -hmm. so, that, so if you have at least four standard deviations, you're showing your process is pretty capable and in control. So um, I was talking to our communications lead, and I was like, well, what, what are we telling people <laughs> for what, what possible subjects of study in school? And obviously the sciences and communications. Um, economics at first gave me the loop, but then um, economics has really good correlations and data analysis, so I could see that yeah. being relevant. Uh, engineering, intellectual, intellectual property law, uh, computer sciences, math and statistics, uh, and technical writing. Technical writing, I added that. Um, I felt she should have had gone there, so I put that. But you have to be able to communicate your ideas in writing because so much of what we work on is attached to our license for our product. And it's not just in English. You have to be able to, be able to explain this in multiple languages. Practical experience. Obviously, there's internships and job shadowing. Attend and give presentations. Um, join science camps and clubs and science fairs. I know AZ just got involved with the new Frederick County Links program, and we've already had a group of Frederick High kids come out and do a little chromatography experiment and try and talk them into doing a little DNA extraction, have some fun. Um, but uh, we're definitely out there at the science fairs. I believe we give away an internship to the high school fair each year. And, um, our person last year was within an s &T, so it was good to work on there. <laughs> and then traits um, to help you succeed. Um, creativity, curiosity, you have to um, always ask questions. In fact, well, I don't have my badge on, but one of my badges had like, something about being, having a questioning attitude. So it's okay to question management on your decisions. Because you have to 
follow the science and, and you know, do the right thing for your patients. Honesty, persistence, obviously, and then the teamwork ties into respect for others and being a gracious winner and loser, um, accepting advice. It's always hard um, to share a project with somebody because they're going to have outside perspective, especially when you put so much work and thought into it already. But um, <coughs> everyone has something to contribute. Check your work. Uh, follow the rules. Learn from mistakes and practice good communication. And there's some acknowledgments. This is CEEA um, and my communications lead, Michelle Michael, and some of the scientists that I get to work with each day. Thank you.